continue. Hello, we're here with Judge Judith Ramsayer, who is running uh, for King County Superior Court Judge position, position 46. Uh, Judge Ramsayer, would you like to go ahead with your two minute introduction? Yes, thank you, Nicole. And I, I wanna thank all of you on the call. I know how much work it is to do this and I appreciate your interviewing me tonight. I am the incumbent for the Superior Court position six. I was uh, uh, first elected in a contested race in 2012, where I enjoyed the endorsement of the 36, I might add. Uh, I had no opponent in 2016, and I hope that's the case again in 2020. But I am a public servant, and I don't own this position. And so I think it's important for me to be out in the county meeting people and giving people the chance to meet me and uh, get to know who I am and how I do the work that I do. I am strongly committed to open courts, to broad public access to the relief that courts offer and to fair and effective courts. And I see part of my job, part of every judge's job, to inspire confidence and trust in the courts. And I think we do that by bringing our A game to everything that we do. And to me, that means bringing my intellect, bringing hard work, bringing compassion and respect and humility, um, the highest professional standards. And by doing that in all of my interactions, I hope that I will inspire trust and confidence in our courts. It's a great honor to be a Superior Court judge, Ten and seconds. it's an honor that I hope to continue over the next four years. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, and now we'll move into our four prepared questions, which Mackenzie has uh, posted into the chat. Um, and the responses, again, for those are two minutes apiece. Um, Mackenzie, actually, would you like to go ahead with question one? Sure. Uh, what are the pros and cons of going to the bench as compared to practicing law? Well, uh, one of the cons of going to the bench is that you lose all control over your time. Uh, it is a, a very demanding job, and anyone who thinks that people go to the Superior Court bench, uh, you know, for semi-retirement is uh, very mistaken. It's a very demanding job, and as a, I was a solo practitioner before I went to the court, and so I was able to set my own uh, calendar my own schedule and, and you can't do that. On the other hand, I just feel so privileged to that people trust me, they bring their problems to me, they trust the impartiality and the careful thought I give to helping solve the problems that are brought to me. So I really have the opportunity to uh, affect people in a more profound way and a broader range of people and problems than I did as a practicing attorney. Great, thank you. Um, Laura, would you uh, be willing to take question number two? What have been the most effective methods for improving court procedures and efficiencies? What other methods would you suggest? You know, it's always important to try to improve efficiency. And I think one of the important measures is that the judge, him or herself, be a good manager. You know, we have to manage our time. We have to manage uh, busy calendars. Uh, and we have to manage our courtrooms. And so um, really, I take the approach that I am sort of the executive director, if you will, of the cases uh, that are on my docket. And so I really get in there and talk with counsel and, and plan ahead and try to keep things moving so that um, 
it, things don't delay or get bumped just because the attorneys haven't had the time to, to turn to them. There are m many efficiencies actually right now in this time of the pandemic and reducing court services to bare essentials. We're using technology in a way that we literally have not before to try to maintain access to the courts. And I believe that some of the things we're doing as an, an emergency measure to keep things moving and to keep access to the courts open, we should seconds. really be looking at uh, as things that we can adopt going forward to make it easier for people to participate in their court business without having to come from remote corners of the county or even Tons maybe things. leave their jobs. Uh, I, I think there are more modern technologies we can bring to the work to make it more efficient. Great, thank you. Uh, Sherry, would you uh, proceed with question three, please? Sure. As a judge, what would you consider your greatest strengths and weaknesses? Uh, I think my my greatest strength is that uh, I, I really am a compassionate person and empathetic person. I I can relate to what other people are feeling and experiencing, and I've had the benefit of living. Uh, you know, having many experiences as I grew up, and I think I really bring a genuine concern and compassion to the work that I do and the people that are appearing before me. I, I want them to know that I hear them, I understand their concerns, I'm taking my work seriously, in reaching the decision that I reach. And I hope I'm able to convey that to people. I think um, I probably have many weaknesses, but one of, one of them is that I am really task oriented. And so I want to get things done. You know, I want to keep things moving. I want us to make concrete progress in cases or uh, in the course of a day. And I think I may um, at times uh, rush things along when people need more time just, just to vent perhaps, even if it doesn't um, promote the ultimate solution, just to give people the message that they really do have the time to uh, present their their care and concern and arguments Ten to the seconds. court and I'm, and I'm going to take it all into account uh, in making my determination. Great, thank you. Um, question four, uh, Jeff, would you be willing to ask that one, please? Oh, I'm sorry. Describe okay. your most difficult case. Why was it difficult and how did you handle it? Oh, I, boy, that's a hard question. Um, I think one of my most difficult cases was um, actually a dissolution. And, um, and, and they're often very difficult, but this one, um, was just in a league of its own and um, there was an accusation um, well first of all one of the parents left the state with the children uh, without permission and was was very uh, recalcitrant and and difficult to get back to the state to address issues in the dissolution most importantly uh, child custody um, there were accusations by one parent uh, against the other of child sexual abuse, and um, they, there were many experts that that parent brought in from different states and, and different backgrounds to work with the children and support the accusations. The other parent vehemently denied the accusations, and 
it's a very different, that's a hard situation and it's a very difficult thing to sort through. And so I independently hired to work on behalf of the court, um, an expert in child sexual abuse from the Harborview Sexual Assault and Trauma Center, who really created the field 30 years ago and are national experts and, and brought this person in as an independent court expert to go through all of the information to interview all of the persons children and parties involved and to give a recommendation as to what she thought the true situation was and um i hope that helped me get to the bottom of a painful and difficult case great thank you um, and so now we'll open this up to uh, one minute follow up qu uh, questions. Um, does anybody have a question they'd like to ask? Um, if so, raise your hand or uh, write me in the chat box. Sometimes it takes a second. Oh, okay, Jason, go ahead. Uh, hello, uh, yes. Could you uh, describe some of your advocacy work? Uh, especially uh, people who have been dis disenfranchised and, and oppressed? Well, I, I did work both as um, a, an attorney, and I've tried to uh, continue that work in, in my role as a judge. Um, I began my legal career working w doing civil rights and habeas corpus work and did a lot of work in, in state prisons. And I continue to have a s strong commitment to um, our criminal, how bad I think our criminal justice system is and um, the need to uh, bring about many reforms. In particular, we, we don't help people come back to the community with any additional skills or supports that are going to give them a chance of success. And in fact, we create these big barriers that they've done their time, but they still can't seconds. overcome these collateral effects. And so I continue to work in that area that I began when I working in when I was a practicing attorney. Great, thank you. Um, any further follow-up questions? Uh, raise your hand or um, write me in the chat box. Jeff. Uh, hi, Judge Ramsayer. It's Jeff Manson. Um, I remember us endorsing you in 2012, and I remember your election night party. If I recall, you had a very uh, notable <laughs> election day that day. Um, oh, my God. <laughs> uh, I think yes. that's the... Um, the, the only election night party I've been to where someone had broken a bone within a few hours. Um, but at least you won. Uh, so anyway, my question is, uh, as you know, our courts and our, our legal system are underfunded like a lot of government. I'm wondering what you've done in the last eight years and what you'll continue to do to advocate for full funding for our legal system. Well, you're absolutely right, and this is an extremely important issue. And for one thing, I chaired our budget, King County Superior Courts Budget Committee for, for three years. And this was actually when we were in really bad uh, budgetary conditions. And so I learned a lot about how it worked. I've been a member of the Superior Court Judges Association. This is now my fifth year. I'm current president of the association. And one of the issues that I absolutely want to press for and work, join in collaboration with the Association of Counties and other courts and legislators is to see if there is some way to change the cap on the property tax. Ten uh, that is the source of general fund funding of the courts because King County is a perfect example of having lots of growth and business, yet because of the cap, we actually have less money available to the courts to do our work. And so I think that's one area that needs Thank you. continued advocacy. That is time. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions? 
Any other follow-ups? Uh, raise your hand using the button or uh, type me in the chat box. All right, I have one. Um, what do you perceive as uh, the greatest obstacles to justice? Yeah. I, I think it's actually people who have legal needs not getting access to justice and uh, whether that's not having accessibility to lawyers um, because they don't have the money or they don't have the wherewithal or they don't know they have the right to some kind of relief or um, just not uh, being able to pursue for one reason or another the uh, relief that potentially is available to them. And I, I think um, people not knowing that they have rights seconds. and then not having a, a method, a modality to seek those rights is the biggest obstacle. Great, thank you. Um, any further questions? We have um, about five minutes left. So we can ask about two more. All right, Jason. Hi, uh, one of my concerns is uh, once a uh, person has gone through the uh, judicial system and completed fines paid, restitution um, settled, and um, um, getting uh, this incident off their criminal record. Um, could you describe some of the uh, um, methods that uh, we need to go to um, to probably make this happen so people can get jobs and have a life? Yeah. Well, I think there's any number of ways to approach that. There is a system that's available to people where you can um, you you can get a proclamation, is it, as it were, from the court, an an order from the court of uh, completion of uh, your criminal sentence and a restoration of civil rights. But there again, that's sort of an example of the last question of people just not knowing that this is available to them or seconds. having the, the, the wherewithal to do it. I don't think that some of these impediments should be allowed. I mean, another angle for this would be to not allow um, employers, and, and in fact, there was change in the legislature, so you can't ask about criminal history, at least on your first interview, but farther down the road, you can. Uh, and 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 allow, except in certain professions, people to be judged on their merit and not on their past. Great, thank you. Uh, any further questions? We have time for about one more. Um, okay, I have another. Uh, what is your general uh, judicial philosophy? I'm not sure I even really understand the question, but I think my, in general, I think judges have a, a huge responsibility to, uh, to really give our best effort in every matter before us. We can't the dial it in. We can't take things for granted. Uh, every person in front of us has to be our most important uh, case, and um, and that takes a lot seconds. of a, a lot of hard work. But that's what we owe the public, and that's what we sign up for. I want everyone to feel that, as I said in my opening, that they've been heard that that justice operated in their case 
even if they don't get precisely the outcome that they were hoping for. And um, I try in all of my interactions to convey that to the people who I'm working with. Great, thank you. And if you'd like to take a minute for a, a wrap up, uh, please go ahead. Well, again, I want to thank you for spending the time. I, I think it's just fantastic that you are engaged in the process like this. I'm also amazed that Jeff remembers I broke my arm, my wrist on election day, and uh, it was not the way I was planning to celebrate, but you know, you can't have everything. As he said, I did win, and I'm so grateful. Um, I've, I've really um, been honored to hold this job for the last eight years, and I want to pursue another four. I have more work to do. I'm excited about the work. And I feel I now have the foundation, the experience, the confidence to do things to really make a difference uh, for the people of King County. And I want, I want the opportunity to do that. Great, thank you. And let me stop the recording.